Right, good morning. Uh, it's 11.30 and this hearing session on matter three, issue three, relating to housing um, is now open. It forms part of the examination of the Great Yarmouth Local Plan Part Two. And this session will be focused on proposed allocations at Caster on Sea, Armstrong, Margaret and Matt. There's a slight change to the hearing programme previously that has been published on the website. Um, the allocations in Hemsby and Belton in the afternoon session, which commences at 2 p.m. instead. Just to check everyone can hear me. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not going to do a, a full opening. Um, we did, we've done that on matter three and on uh, at the start, the very start of matter three, uh, but it might be a little bit longer because we've got um, participants that haven't been here here before. So I'll just start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Gareth Walgoose. I'm the inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to independently conduct um, this examination and to report to the council in due course. The format of the hearings are structured and focused discussions that I shall lead and are based broadly upon the matters, issues and questions that are available on the council's examination website. Uh, the purpose of the hearing sessions is, enable, is to enable all of you to put forward your points of view and to, to help me to get the information that I need um, to assess the soundness of the plan. Full details of my role and an overview of the purpose of the hearings and the examination pro process are available within guidance notes that I've already published on the Council's examination website, alongside the details of how to get in touch with uh, the programme officer, Annette Feeney, that participants may be familiar with from when they entered the meeting, but um, it may be something that observers at some point or other participants may wish to, to contact. Uh, Mrs. Feeney. She's she's a program officer who's independent, um, hasn't worked on the, the council's plan. She works under my direction and she'll be the first point of contact if anyone requires any assistance. I'll, I also advise the parties, um, participants and any observers who are interested in trying to follow the hearings um, to regularly check the council's examination web pages. It will be the main source of updates outside of the hearing sessions in terms of the ongoing examination. Um, including any updates to the hearing, pro hearings programme and any documents subsequently published either at my request or any resulting from actions that I've given to particularly the council. It's also where the examination library documents that will be referred to during the hearing sessions can be accessed if people want to look at those in a little bit more detail. As mentioned, the event is being live streamed and it's, it's not discretionary as it's necessary to ensure that the hearings are publicly accessible for non-participants. If you do not wish to appear on video, I'm happy for your camera to be turned off. However, if you do not wish to be live streamed at all, you should leave the event now. And in such circumstances, I will rely on any previous written representations that you have made. To, to avoid any disruption, I'd also ask participants to either switch off the mobile phones or turn them to silent now. An inspector note for participants has been published on specifically on virtual events in addition to the guidance note. That's because um, obviously in, in, in light of current restrictions, we've, we've had to proceed with the hearing sessions um, through virtual events rather than the, not the traditional face-to-face -face physical events where we'd all be in the same room and around the table discussing it. Hopefully this experience will, will replicate that as, as closely as it possibly can. Um, but obviously there are procedures and, and, and involved in the Zoom platform that we're using. Um, you should be, from that guidance document that I prepared on virtual events, you should be familiar with um, that process and you, there was the opportunity for a test event, which some of you may have participated in. Um, so I'm not gonna repeat in details all the Zoom controls other than just to confirm that the chat, reaction and screen share functions, if you're able to use them, please don't do so because um, they shouldn't be used uh, so as to avoid any disruption to this discussions. I'd also just like to remind participants of the general principles of having your microphone turned off unless invited to speak by me and the use of the raised hand, hand facility within the, the participants list. Um, that will draw my attention um, when, you, when you wish to speak. Um, please be patient because I'll, in, I'll invite participants to speak in an order which I consider best to assist me so it may not necessarily be the, the person that puts the hand up first. Um, I'll try and bring people at a natural point in the discussion. Um, but, and, but when you're given that opportunity, just please say what you feel you need to say. Um, 
Please make your contributions brief, focused and relevant to the point on the agenda. I, I have read your representations, so you don't need to repeat your full case, agree or disagree with the points already made or give any formal presentation. Right, before we before I get into timings, if we can just do for the per, for my benefit, because we and the benefit of new participants that haven't um, haven't haven't been in part part of discussions either in matter one, two, or previous matter matter three. Can we just do some introductions? So I'll start with the council first. Shall I come to you, Mr. Hubbard? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, my name is Sam Hubbard. I'm a strategic planning manager at Great Yarmouth Borough Council. Also appearing with me at the hearings this week is my colleague Kim Balls. Uh, good morning, sir. Kim Ball, Senior Strategic Plan for Borough Council. Thanks, Mr. Balls. And Nick Fountain. Good morning. My name is Nick Fountain. I'm a Senior Strategic Planner at the Borough Council. Thanks, Mr. Fountain. And then can I take Mr. Dobson, please? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Mervyn Dobson. I'm a Director at HD Town Planning. I'm representing for Simon Homes this morning. I'm not actually just make it clear that I'm not dealing with the planning application itself, which you'll probably or read about in the representations. That's being dealt with by Bidwell's Mr. Darren Cogman. That may be an advantage, sir, in the sense that we don't get dragged into a lot of detail, albeit I am pretty well briefed on the negotiations and discussions up to date. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Dobson. I, I, it wasn't it wasn't really my intention to get too deep into the detail of the planning application because obviously we're looking at the soundness of soundness of the allocation. But it might be helpful if if the council or any parties that are familiar with elements that might assist me in understanding the soundness if if any points are clarified. But I'm, there's not an expectation to to go to to go to an, any significant depth in the plan application, particularly because if it's still a pending application, I wouldn't want to to prejudge any, any particular issues on that matter. So it, it, it's appropriate to keep those set, as separate as possible. Thank you. Mr. Gilder. Good morning, my name's Edward Gilder. I'm the Land and Planning Manager for Badger Building in Lowestoft. I'm a Chartered Town Planner. Thank you, Mr. Gilder. Mr. Wilson. Good morning, sir. I'm Dave Wilson, um, Engineer, Major in Estate Development at the County Council. Um, this morning, I'm representing the Highway Authority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Right before I start, is there any are there any procedural matters, particularly from the council or any other parties, before before I just get into a few points of clarification on actions in the hearings program? It's repeat much of it's repeating from the first session, but for the benefit of those that may not have either participated or view, viewing it, Mr. Hubbard, anything? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Yes, just to confirm. Uh, we had a discussion in the earlier matter three issue two session this morning for those that, that were unable to to view it um just just reflecting on discussions that have already taken place in matter three and some of the actions that have been provided to the council the council has provided me with um an action list a, a draft action list from up to the end of uh, yesterday end of yesterday's hearings um in terms of the request that i've made pass them through the program officer and I've provided my feedback. It's our intention to compile um, any further actions that are arising from discussions today into, into a list uh, that the council will provide to, to the, the program officer and then I'll provide any comments. And hopefully that should be finalized at some point tomorrow uh, with the aim to get the, the document on the website so that participants can see the actions um, that are required from the council and by what date. So participants can get a feel for when, when that documentation may, may be available to familiarise themselves with it and, and consider whether they, 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 they wish to be heard on, on those particular matters. Um, please be slightly patient in terms of the deadlines that are given um, in the actions list. Obviously, the actions list is for me to receive that information. I understand sometimes it can take a little a little bit extra time for council's websites and the examination website to be updated. So just check, check within a day or two. Um, of, of those deadlines and for, for the documents that are there. And obviously, if you've got any issues in terms of accessing the documents that should be there as a result of the actions list, then um, Mrs Feeney will be your first part of call. Just contact Mrs Feeney, she'll let you know if there's anything in progress on those matters. Now, obviously, in terms of those those actions and the, the, the updates that I've asked in particular to some of the, the housing evidence that the council will be providing me by the end of March. So that's the 31st of March. 
uh, which is, is one of the main actions that that, that, that will be pending. Um, it, it is likely that participants um, in, in all three of the issues of matter three may want may wish to be heard on some of those updates and and, and the influence it may have on, on the representations they've previously made. Um, I've asked the council to specifically identify when updating the supply, um, where the updates have been made to the most recent document, which is document C, C6.2, um, just to highlight so that people, so that participants and myself don't need to go through things that have already been discussed and remain unchanged from the previous, previous sessions. However, if people in previous sessions have felt that they didn't get their opportunity to be heard on certain matters or, or, or there's, there's something particular from their reps they'd want to draw my attention to on a particular site that we that isn't covered by those updates, um, they will, there will be an opportunity for participants to be involved in, in that session in the third week. I think at the minute I'm, lo I'm looking at the reserve days that are in week three, so that would that, be the two sessions that were always reserved for housing um, which will be on Wednesday, the 28th of April. Um, it, when, just to clarify, if, if, if participants in any of the Matter 3 sessions um, to date want to be involved in that and want to write to be heard, I would advise that, that you check your diaries and make yourself available for the 9.30 session because obviously in terms of the, the approach that the examination takes, once I've heard what all I need from the participants in a session, we may not use the second session. I'm just going to keep it there as a, a little bit of a contingency, depending on um, the updates that are received and the number of participants who wish to be heard on, on that matter. Mr Hubbard, or, or any, anyone else from the council, any comments on, on that approach? No, sir. You're content with that approach, I'm assuming, yes? Yeah. Thank you. Um, anything from participants? No, con content to await that information and, re and reflect upon it. And um, just, just one, one, when once that information is available, obviously you can you can notify Mrs. Feeney that you wish to participate in those reserve sessions as soon as possible. If you you're fairly clear that you wish to do so, or there's there's matters relate you you you're fairly confident there's matters relating to the update that you'll that that will influence anything that you you've had to say or or wish to say in the future. Um, you can do so before the 31st of March, but I'd ask you to try and let Mrs Feeney know as soon as possible, say, um, the end of the first week in April, um, if you wish to participate in, in the reserve sessions after you've reviewed the evidence. Thank you. Any, any other procedural matters? I don't have any, any other announcements at this particular stage, so I'll, I'll just move on to timings. So. The matters to be discussed today are based on my matters, issues and questions published in the examination library on the council's website. I'll do my best to follow it, although many of those questions are necessarily grouped together as part of the more focused questioning, taking account of the submission of hearing statements to ensure that discussions are efficient and avoid repetition. The hearing session is scheduled to be approximately 90 minutes long. Um, matter three, issue three is intended to continue, continue at 2 p.m. However, this, this session is intended to focus on K, the allocation at Caister, uh, those at Ormsby St. Margaret and Martham, and hopefully we'll get through those um, with the, the session at 2 p.m., moving on to Goldston on Sea, Hopton on Sea, Hemsby and Belton. Obviously, when, when we, it may be the case um, that with this 90-minute session that we might need a, a little bit additional time just to, to get through everything to be discussed. Um, and I hope people wouldn't have any issues if we maybe extend by 15 minutes and reduce the, the lunch break to to um, 45 minutes. Would there be any issues from participants on that? Um, if, if there's a possibility of running to one one fifteen, uh, one fifteen, if that's necessary. No, that, that, that's appreciated. Obviously, the, the, we've, we've got the option of reserve time, but if we can get through as much as possible today on the allocations, that, that would be helpful. There may be the possibility of updates um, that I asked the council to make with respect to some of the some of the discussions we have, but it's useful to try and get through as much as much as possible um, as early as possible in the examination, and and therefore we can focus any discussions in week three on anything that's that's, that's effectively new. Right. Um, 
I believe that the, the I believe that because it's a bit different session, and there may be the opportunity if you're staying in for this, the session this afternoon to to continue through. But I think uh, the program officers provided an individual link for this afternoon's meeting. So if you do decide to stay in, um, and if if you if you're able to, I'm not quite sure how how the meeting's set up um, in that respect today. Um, just make sure that your microphone and your, your microphone's muted and your camera's turned off when I adjourn the adjourn the meeting to the afternoon. Um, I just want want to make sure that you do that to avoid any unintended um, invasions on your privacy outside of the hearing session. Thank you. Any questions before I move move on into into the actual my questions on relating to the matters issues and questions? Nothing. Right. Well, we'll move we'll move swiftly on. I'll take. Um, Matter, matter three, issue three, and this this question is going to cover um, questions one, six, and seven of my matters, issues, and questions grouped together. So the session itself follows on follows on from previous sessions relating to the spatial strategy. So that was matter two, and those those others in matter three relating to housing need and requirement and the supply. Um, of this this session does relate a lot, some of it to the supply elements covering the. The allocations itself but it, then it moves on to the detail of the allocations and obviously the approach of the policies itself so what what i'd, I'd start to my intended to focus um before i move on to the specific allocations and their associated policies um, the council's provided a response to a question i had relating to the site selection process and referred to me to the pro approach in the sustainability appraisal documents so that's document a3.1 and a3.2 with particular reference to section six of the sustainability appraisal, which sets out the justification for selecting options and consideration of alternatives together with appendix four, which includes the full appraisals. Now, I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll ask the same question for the later session um, so that it can it, it can be covered um, for each for each of the allocations. But I'd, I'd welcome the council if the council can just give a, a brief overview to, to start the discussion just on each allocation and the the, the approach that the council has taken in terms of identifying that particular site and why it, why it pursued that site only has to be very brief and obviously you can point me to where the detail evidence on on that is if, if it's already clearly set out um, but in with respect to case to C in particular um, I, I would like the council's view um, in terms of site 35 which is referred to in the main sustainability appraisal but does not appear in the associated section of appendix four and is instead referred to in appendix three as not subject to sustainability appraisal due to the presence of an outline application uh, just can the council briefly clarify that as alongside the site the broader site selection approach to each each site and, and why you came to propose that each of those allocations um is there anyone from the council who wishes to lead So now I'll, I'll I'll pick that up. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the the sustainability appraisal, quite clearly as you can see, set out in um, section six of the sustainability appraisal, it's it's organised by uh, settlement tier and and then by um, settlement as well. So we can see, you can see the consideration of all of the alternative sites that we've considered, with the inclusion of the uh, of, of the preferred sites. I suppose the key thing is is it to, to look at in that section are the reasons for why certain sites have been been discounted. So for each site that's not allocated, there is there there, there, there is a, there is a reason. I think as we pointed out more, most in 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 general terms, um, uh, back in matter one, the sites that we uh, allocated we consider to generally be the the more sustainable sites, like those ones that perhaps got better access to services and facilities, um, low environmental impacts um, and, and, and the like. But whilst also the, considering the overall context provided by policy CS2 and in ensuring that there is, the, the distribution of, of development overall um, meets, meets, uh, meet, meets that, that distribution set out in CS2. Uh, in terms of that, that specific question uh, about the alternative site in uh, Caister, my colleague, uh, Mr. Fountain, is just, just double checking through the paperwork for that just to, to provide an explanation. 
Yes, that, that that's fine. It, it, again, it, that might be something that you want to pick up in 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 the in the March updates if it's necessary. And, and and my assumption is not whether it's intended or whether it, it wasn't intended that it's something that can be updated in due course. Uh, I mean, as part, as part of the SA process. I think from the top of my head, it relates to a site which we discussed actually yesterday um, uh, at uh, St Nicholas Drive. But, we could, but, but, but Nick will confirm that. Yes, no problem. And, and just in terms of that point that you made in the context of, of policy CS2, would it be okay? Obviously, we've had discussions on policy CS2 already within, within other matters, but as part of the end of March update, would it be okay to, to give me an, an updated position with that in terms of what, once you've made your changes, our updates to your land supply, if there's any significant changes, whether how how a compare and contrast to what was submitted then to what it will be as a result of the updates. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, I think we might put that in the actions from, from yesterday, but if we haven't, we'll make sure that, that that's there because we did assume that that might be a, a, another implication of update in the, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's probably only likely, based on what we've discussed so far, it's probably only likely to, to tweak those percentages um, for ever so yeah. slightly. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just it's just so that I have a clear picture. I think the the danger when when I ask for what I've asked for in in the previous sessions in terms of a comprehensive update is that some things get updated and they have a knock on effect, and that knock on effect isn't picked up. And I think that that's what I'd ask the council to to review is if you make those changes, what knock on effect does it have elsewhere in things that are maybe factual, which which might which which might of itself not be an issue but i'd rather make sure that i in terms of updating the plan you could you could do so from a factual perspective but from my perspective i need to understand that i'm working on the most up-to-date position across the board really so that'd just be helpful to me and i think obviously that you have got a bit of time now between the, the end of march and, and that, i think that should be achievable um, unless you tell me otherwise okay Happy with that. Uh, any, anything else on the individual application, in the individual allocations, or are you ju just refer me back to the sustainability present? I have, I have read that the the justification, the justification for for the selection of the sites and discounting of sites. It's just whether you've anything to add on that. And um, not not specifically in general terms. Uh, no, I mean we can put, we'll probably talk a little bit more about the overall. Uh, merits of each site as we get get into that into those those particular discussions i know my colleague um mr fountain has now got his hand up so yeah, we'll to provide some advice on that yeah i've noticed his hands up yes mr. thanks mr Hogan, mr fountain thank you inspector um yes I, I just had a look at um site 35 i was just uh, clarifying uh, myself exactly which site it was but i believe it is the site at saint nicholas drive uh, that we were discussing yesterday um and this is a site that um did get planning permission um and and was on that basis uh, for consistency where sites have uh, received planning permission they were not appraised um, however, obviously, in the, in the fullness of time going through the sustainability appraisal process, this was a site that we had been assessing. And I, I think that's why it was sort of listed uh, potentially in, in, in error under the um, sustainability appraisal report in page 58, um, where we've listed the sort of the comparative um, uh, disadvantages, um, but uh, we clearly do say in in, uh, in Appendix Three um, that it is a site with planning permission and hasn't been appraised for that for that reason. So it's just a matter of consistency. It was part of the iterative process. It was a site that historically we had appraised, but had subsequently got planning permission and should have been listed as a site that we hadn't appraised for the for the reason that it got planning permission. Yes, and and just on on that on that point, and obviously that that process that you've done, you've tried to reflect that up to date up to date position. And um, just in terms of the essay, obviously I asked the question previously about sites being missing or or anything in terms of the essay, and, and you said you didn't think there was, but you'd check. And it, I think I said by the end of end of the day um, today, I'm happy to extend that if there's a need to look if it will be helpful. In terms of looking at the updates that you're making, whether the, whether you think then that there might be any knock-on effects to update the sustainability appraisal in due course as a consequence of that. 
Um, I, I think on the action list, we, we had to the to the end of the week. Um, yeah, written down. yeah. Um, so I mean, we were intending to to meet that that date. Okay. And like like I said, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy if you can meet that date. That's absolutely fine. If you think you need a bit more time to look at the updates and consider what updates you might need to make to the sustainability appraisal, that might be helpful to me anyway. For me to understand in terms of the work that you do on the 31st of March, if there's any results and actions that you consider where the essay might need to be updated. You don't have to update the essay at this stage, but at least give me a scope of what what areas you might be looking to update as we move forward with the examination. Okay. Is there any comments from participants on site selection process, the selection of any of the allocations in case the Armsby St. Margaret or Martha? Nothing? Right, just move. Just moving on to treatment of emission sites, as per my guidance notes, it's not my intention um, today to focus discussions on in the individual merits of emission sites, as if I were to identify soundness issues necessitating the identif identification of additional housing supply. Um, such matters will be for the Council to propose a preferred way forward in the first instance. Nevertheless, I welcome the views of any participants um, on, on that, on, on the, the possibility of the difference in sites. So my assumption is that there was, there was nothing on site selection. So no one's, no one wants to mention the merits of any of the allocations relative to emission sites in at this particular point. Um, my understanding is that Mr. Dobson and Mr. Gilder, you both, you, you both got sites with, you both got, you both got discussions pending away relating to our allocations that we're going to discuss. Is that correct? Or is that why did Mr. Dobson does, Mr. Gilder? No, sir, we, we don't have any applications pending on sites we're going to discuss. We have an application pending on a site that unfortunately we're not going to discuss. Okay, Mr. Gilder, is that is, is the reason why we weren't going to discuss it because, because of the approach of not discussing emission sites at this particular point in time? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Gilder, just I assume your contribution relates in the round though where you bring in issues, wider issues in the context of the strategy in, in that context, although we're not discussing that specifically because I, 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 I take the point that, that in terms of supply, we, we've had a broader discussion in, in on issue two as it stands. Well, <coughs> yes. Yes, sir. My, my, my contribution is essentially that uh, there are a number of sites that we think won't come forward, which brings into question whether the supply figures are accurate. And if they're not, then the council will have to find some more land, and we hope they'll find in favour of our land. Okay. That's, that's the nature of our argument. And, and, and that's, that's the representations you're going to make today on, yes. on, on a number of applications. Yeah, yes. that, that was my understanding. Thank, thank you, Mr Gilder. Okay, but just before we get into into specific sites, um, just just to, just a couple of, of more overarching strategic uh, issues. Council's already provided the general response to the matter of loss of best and most versatile agricultural land arising from the plan, and I've, we've already had questions where the councils uh, made reference to that. So it wasn't my intention to cover that in any any particular detail today. Similarly, the approach to min minerals resources, we've, we've also had a, had a question on. So again, I'm not going to, I wasn't planning on um, uh, devoting any significant time to that unless participants wanted to do so now. Um, similarly, the council's clarified that the allocations are generally at lower flood risk than, than other alternatives as, as shown within the sustainability appraisal um, and the more constrained areas in much of the borough. However, the query I had in that regard is in terms of the approach to allocations in flood zone one, um, is, what, what, is there a reason why the council's requiring a specific uh, site specific flood risk assessment? And in, in terms of the requirements of planning practice guidance and relating to the framework.
Well, with regard to flood risk assessments, the National Plan and Policy Framework sets out that you need to submit flood risk assessment for any site over one hectare. So, um, hence we've picked that up in um, our allocations along with uh, some some detail around sustainable drainage measures, which Anglian Water were quite keen to, to, to have covered it in, in planning policies. Thank you. Anything from anything from in, interested parties in terms of any of the, any of those matters? Thank you. Right. Well, we'll move we'll move swiftly on to um, case on C. So policy CA one, which. In the plans known as land west of Jack Chase Way, case on sea, but I mean it's also been referred to during the discussions as Nova Scotia Farm. Is that correct, Mr. Dobson? Okay. Right. I'll just start start with my initial initial question. Um, is that the evidence before me on relating to policy CA one? indicates that the planning application submitted in November 2019 proposed a residential development of 665 dwellings, which is lower than the approximately uh, 725 dwellings referred to in the policy wordings in the submitted plan. Can any of the participants assist me in providing an update on the status of that planning application? Bearing in mind what we've already said, Mr. Dobson, in terms of the extent, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking to prejudice any 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 discussions or negotiations between the council and, and the applicants that are taking place um, and also whether in light of those intentions the approximate num housing number in the allocation and contribution to housing supply in the plan trajectory are realistic now um, is that one for you mr dobson or is that would the council prefer to to open on on that question I, I'm happy that the council opened on it because I think Mr. Fountain uh, has a good handle on the negotiations, probably better than I have actually. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dobson. Mr. Hubbard or Mr. Fountain, who has best best placed? I think it'll be me, me sir. Um, no, in terms of the, uh, the the plan application, it it is it's still pending. It we, we don't we don't have a specific date yet for it to go before our planning committee. There's still some discussions going on around the the master plan and other aspects of detail which i don't think we need to necessarily go into a huge amount of detail here um i don't think we can really say too much more on the, than that at this point in time on on the actual planning application apart from it remains a live live application which which, which discussions are ongoing uh, i mean the, the the overall uh consultation period has closed but but given there are amendments potentially amendments coming to the application there could be a further consultation on, on on the application before it reaches planning committee okay and there's no there's no indication of any even vague time scales of when when it might be determined well our our view is is that we need to, to see the outcome of this process to be in a, in a position to be able to, to properly determine it. But that, again, that's part of the discussions we're having with the, with the applicant and, we, and those discussions are ongoing. Okay, and in, in terms of the overall dwelling numbers, it, are you still content with 725 on that basis? Or is, or is, is it something where, where a potential range might be more suitable? Well, I think the, the, the number 725 has been something that's been supported by um, the, uh, by Persimmon um, up until receipt of them, their most recent uh, hearing statements. I think what we've, we've put in each policy um, is, an, is, 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 is to um, set dwelling numbers as approximate numbers. There's always going to be some degree of flexibility around those. They, they could go up, they could go down. Um, I think 665 is broadly within the realms of approximate 725. So I don't think we're too concerned about, about that. I think, yes, there is a, there, there is a live plan and application in for 665, but I don't think that necessarily demonstrates that there's no way that you could achieve more on that site. Um, so I don't think there's any need to, to be changing the policy in, in that regard. And just, just bear one moment. I'm just going, going to um, document CS. Six two. And just in, in, in terms of in terms of the overall contribution, I wonder whether I wonder whether the approach in table C to the local plan application, the 
the, the local plan allocations, whether obviously you've got the number in terms of developable, um, you've got 570 dwellings in there. Um, ob obviously I can take Mr. Dobson's view in terms of the real how realistic the leading times and build out rates are, um, taking account of what commentary is already there. Um, but in terms of the six, the difference between 665 and, and 725, would it be better to take a cautious approach in terms of developable supply on the basis of that, that allocation? So I think this one's slightly more confusing than, 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 than the average site in the, uh, in the trajectory. Um, and perhaps it's, not, it's best not to look at the, the five-year supply as, as a source of information. Okay. We, we put together with our hearing statements an appendix to the matter free statement, which, which um, includes a full trajectory for each site. Um, unfortunately, it, it, we haven't put page numbers on it, so it's not, it's not that helpful to, to guide you to the right, the right place. But... Essentially, we're expecting that part of this site will actually be delivered beyond the plan period. So we've made the assumption that 505 houses on this site would be delivered within the period to the end of 2030, with the, with the remaining 220 coming forward beyond 2030. Yes, so, so what you're saying to me there is, whether it's 665 or whether it's, it's 725, it doesn't make any difference in the grand scheme of things in terms of in terms of the developable supply. Obviously, I can take I can take any any comments that Mr. Dobson has in terms of the deliverable supply in terms of the contribution, but in terms of developable supply, the the the, the, the six six five and seven two five because because of the amount that would be post plan period, it's not it doesn't it doesn't make a huge amount of difference between those two numbers. That's right. It, 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 makes, it makes no difference to the overall plan supply. I'd take that point. Mr. Dobson? Thank you, sir. I, I am on already, aren't I? Not, I didn't mute my uh, uh, microphone, so apologies for that. Um, just going back to the, uh, the timescale, um, it is, as uh, uh, Mr. Hubbard has indicated, it's going to be contingent basically on your preliminary uh, findings, I think, uh, the local authority being cautious about that. My understanding was the information I've been fed by uh, Persimmon is that um, the likelihood is originally uh, it had been hoped that it would be uh, considered, the application would be considered in June, uh, but that's been pushed back slightly to the autumn. Um, there is always the question of section 106 after that, and that is probably why the, all the criteria which are attached to policy CA1 are important, because they come into play during the negotiations on the section 106. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Gilder indicated to you yesterday, uh, unfortunately, the Borough Council don't have a terribly good record when it comes to dealing with Section 106s quickly. So notwithstanding all of that, um, the overall timescale uh, leading towards uh, start on um, uh, the services and so forth, uh, leading to uh, also reserve matter applications and so forth, we are confident that we could get it start in the year 2022-23, which is broadly what the local authority have indicated. <clears throat> I'll go on and uh, deal with the five-year land supply issue um, together with the overall delivery over the planned period before I go back to the numbers. Uh, so um, I, you'll see from our representations that we, Persimmon, have been undertaking development in Caster, so they're uh, that's at the point is east side, just the other side of Jack Chase Way. So they're pretty clear as to the, the level of demand, which is like to exist in Caster, which is you know, separate from that in GY generally. Um, it's, it's been a very successful site and they've been able to produce 72 or more dwellings per year. So that site, which was just under 200 dwellings, has been delivered in three years. So we anticipate slightly higher rates of build than the local authority, so that the majority of the site, probably all of it, could be developed within the plan period. Uh, I mean, how important that is, I, I'm not sure. I suppose it, it, it affects the ability of the authority to deliver their housing requirement figure to some degree. Um, but we anticipate that uh, we're slightly more optimistic in terms of build rates than the local authority. I think just get back to the... In terms of that first year, though, 
Um, you say that you make a start on 2022, 23. Do you still do you still think that 35 dwellings in that year would be feasible? It would be, but it's completely dependent on the local authority speed of considering applications and uh, how this uh, plan progresses. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, it, with a with a fair wind. Yeah. Yes. Obviously, I've got I've got to. Uh, uh, I've got the information that's in front of me, so I'll have to make a judgment on whether I think it's realistic or not. Yeah, certainly so. Um, the, the question of the overall numbers, I think the position we have been adopting throughout the consultation process, was we, we would have preferred to see a figure of up to 725 dwellings uh, coming off the site because <clears throat> Uh, as is often the case, uh, when you get to look at the details uh, of the constraints affecting a site, they, they tend to whittle away at the numbers. And in this case, we've got a, effectively a 10% reduction. The reason for that is, is evident when you look at the, the detail of the other facilities that are required on the site or the local authority require on the site, which we're not objecting to in the slightest. But there is a, a two hectare school site, there's a one hectare local centre, and there's a 0 0.75 for uh, health facilities, uh, and they all into, eat into the, the net developable area. In addition to that, we've got over 25% of the site, which they require for the local authority require for open space, which, as I've indicated in my representations, does appear to be slightly on the high side. But all of that has had the effect of actually reducing the numbers by 10% to 665. Um, I think, does it make a difference? It makes a difference, obviously, in terms of ability to meet the requirement. Um, uh, it, from our point of view, the most important point is that those criteria uh, that are included in policy CA1 should be related to the number of dwellings rather than, uh, uh, rather than just an area. So um, by that, I mean, that if you look at some of the contributions, the contributions are, should be on a, a, on a per dwelling basis rather than just an aerial basis. Uh, I think most of them are, but uh, I'm gonna come back to you at some stage and talk about contributions, for example, on health authority land, where the requirement is significantly above that which will be required to deal with the health needs of the, of the population deriving from that uh, allocation. Yes, you, 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 thank you, thank you, Mr. Dobson. I think you are co you're covering areas of uh, where I've probably got more detailed questions and we'll, we'll pick okay. up in future those. I think your observation in particular in terms of the linkage between whatever dwellings come forward, I think that there is some validity to that and I'm going to ask questions on that in particular and then obviously the other elements of your representations as well. I think we'll, unless the council's got any, anything to add at that at this particular point, I'm happy to just move on into the policy criteria and start discussing discussing that, if that's okay. So I think the, the, first, the first thing that I picked up when looking at the, the policy itself um, was just the, the identifier, identification of the local centre, which I previously touched on at, at part H. Um, and, and it... Obviously, I've asked the council to clarify its approach um, in potentially need, the need to do that in policy UCS 7, which we'll discuss in more detail in any case as part of matter 4. Um, there, may, there may need to be some, like I, like I mentioned in, in the earlier discussions, I think it might have been in matter 2, um, I need to pr provide some clarity in that respect to, to make clear the distinction between the needs figure um, for retail and any locational based requirements uh, that are needed to support development in this in this particular case. Um, my assumption is that that scale of that loc location based requirement is in, is calculated on the basis of of some form of formula or methodology in terms of in terms of the needs or what's considered to be appropriate for that particular location. Would that be correct, Mr. Hubbard? I think it's approximate, and it does talk about up to one hectare rather than being precise um, on, on, on that figure. But it's based on similar scales of other local centres. I mean, one hectare would be quite large um, on, on the large size. And I think there is there is scope for a range of potential uses with it, within that, um, including the potential for a, a community facility should it be required by the parish council in that particular location. Um, I think at the moment that their, their, their view is that they'd rather have it somewhere else. Um, but 
nevertheless, there is there is scope within that one hectare. So there is flexibility there. And the kind of it comes back to the overall developable area that, that uh, Mr. Dobson was talking about. There, there is there is still some flex within the overall policy for accommodating more growth. And, this, and, it, and it, I think something we've raised before with, with Persimmon is, is that you, we can look at potential vertical mixing of uses on places like the, the local centre. That could be an, air, an a, area where it might be more uh, appropriate to accommodate some of the elements of housing with care, which was set out, set out as a 10% requirement and further up the, 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 the policy on criteria B. So I think it's quite a flexible uh, approach and something that can only really be refined through more detailed planning on the site. Ah, okay. And, and just, just to pick up that point, um, my assumption is that you that you didn't put in a requirement for master planning because of the, the possibility of, of an, an application proceeding proceeding it as as the you've got one that's with the council at the minute. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. I mean, I think ideally for for a site of this scale, we'd we'd have wanted to have to, to have some a master plan development brief, um, either within the, the plan itself or as a supplementary planning document for such development applications come forward. But I think given where we are with the site and the fact that there is this live application and already master planning work has been starting to be undertaken by the applicant, which we, as I've already said, we're still in discussions with them over it. I think it, 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 it's, it's not in the best interest to, 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 to do that now. Yeah, so you, you're just looking at this policy to kind of provide a framework. So that's why the, the wording of, that, for example, that criterion part H it, is fairly loose because it'll allow you to, to be a little bit flexible in, yeah. in that context. Um, so it's kind of sub, substituting for any delay that you would have otherwise had requiring a master plan to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yes, you did briefly refer to um, the care element which is part b um so sorry mr dobson i'll go back to you you've got your hand up are you are you happy for me to proceed on on this question um yes sir i was just going to pick up a point that mr hubbard raised there which is okay. that that uh, he feels that there's adequate flexibility uh, contained within the criteria uh, and that's perfectly true in relation to um i think it was h that he referred to i think my concern is that that some of the other criteria are a bit more inflexible um and therefore they set the background if you like to any negotiations on section 106 and we as applicants are relying wholly on the authority to retrospectively apply some flexibility and what i'm looking for is a little more flexibility in some of the other aspects of the criteria uh, that was similar to that that was contained in h okay yes i, 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 tell you that, I think I, i'm moving i'm moving on now to what, what, what mr hubbard mentioned in terms of the additional uh, provision of retirement housing and housing with care in addition to the um, affordable housing requirement that will apply. So I'm talking about criterion B as opposed to, uh, and in addition to criterion B. So it'd just be helpful for the, if the council could provide a summary of its justification for, for that particular requirement. Uh, I, I have taken account of the response that, you, that you've raised to, to me having already asked this particular question. Um, because obviously the, 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 the appear, it appears to be slightly more than what you... Obviously, I understand this is a larger allocation than other allocations that are proposed in the plan. Um, but it, do, it does, the, the policy requirement in that respect does appear to be higher than, than what, what's attributed to some of the smaller applications. And it's just the extent to which those matters have been assessed in viability and, what, and how they link to um, paragraph 56 of the framework in terms of to make development acceptable. Silver. Okay, so you're starting with the uh, the, the housing with care, care requirement of uh, of ten percent of the total housing on on the site. I think as we've already discussed under the previous issues under matter three, there is an aging population within the borough. The majority of household growth over the next ten years will be in the over sixty fives, and according to the county councils evidence which we referred to in our hearing statement um, that the, the living well homes for Norfolk strategy does include a breakdown needs doesn't cover the period of 2030 unfortunately but it does look to 2036 and there's there, there is going to be quite a substantial need for, for, for the for, for 
sheltered housing and extra care housing as part of the overall housing mix. So that's not in addition to the objective of the assessed needs, which we've talked about. It's part of it. It's part of that 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 element. And this this type of need can be quite difficult to to secure, particularly at the, the plan making stage. Um, those sites need to have very good access to services and facilities uh, generally, um, and hence while we've got some of those elements of the policy in 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 uh, I think it's H11 that we discussed um, previously. But in terms of actually being able to allocate some land for this 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 type of development, we thought probably the, the best approach to do this would be to look at the, the the larger allocations where there was potentially more scope for different developers to pick up parts of those sites. Um, now I appreciate with regard to this particular site and say one it is wholly under the control of, of a single developer at the moment. Um, but we've got a similar approach to the uh, um, to policy GN1 yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but if we look at the uh, the uh, MPPF, paragraph 91 is quite big on supporting mixed communities and promoting social interaction, including opportunities for meetings between people who may other, not otherwise come into contact with each other. I think that's quite a key key factor and then in paragraph 13 of the ppg on oh, plan and practice guidance sorry on older people housing sets out location is really key for older people housing and sites need good access to, to, to public transport local amenities health services and town centers well i think this site and the, the site in in Goulston do provide perfect examples of that of, of, of those sites those types of site this site's We've got a proposed health centre on it. We've got uh, a local centre as well, so potentially some shopping facilities and maybe some other community facilities as well. And the scale of the site will will, will create a need for, uh, will allow for a viable bus service. So hence why we think it's it, 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 it's it, it's a good good site for this, and, and it's a, and, and therefore could make a real good contribution to meeting some of those those needs which we might not otherwise meet. And, and it fits with your viability evidence, does it? So the viability evidence is a little bit more complex on uh, the uh, extra care and sheltered housing. There's there's no scope for affordable housing contribution from those elements of the scheme. So we can we know we can achieve twenty percent affordable housing off the back of um, uh, general market housing, but in terms of market housing related to sheltered and extra care housing it is viable on its own it stacks up and provides a, a positive land value um above and beyond the benchmark land value and this is all detailed in, in in our viability assessment um c30 which has a which has a whole section on the viability of older people housing but on greenfield sites the older people housing is 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 viable so we wouldn't expect the 20 percent affordable housing requirement to apply to the older people element of the of the site only the, the the overall market housing provision standard market housing provision is that clarified anywhere in in, in, in the plan um probably not as well as it no probably not particularly um i think you, i think you do cover that at 3.1136 is, is that right the last sentence says the affordable housing requirement will not apply to the accommodation comprising retirement yeah. Care housing and this type of housing has less viability to cross subsidise the delivery of affordable housing. Thank you for spotting that, sir. I forgot. No, I'd okay. Forgotten. I'd added that bit in. But that's okay. That's fine. I, I, I don't want to shoot you. I don't want you to shoot yourself in the foot on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Dobson, thank thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, I think Mr. Hubbard was alluding to some of the conversations and discussions which have been going on with the application. I think the problem that I have with B as it's currently drafted is that it is, it is a mandatory requirement as I see it. Um, it's not something which Persim and my clients would actually uh, undertake. It, it, it could be on a site which was sold off to a specialist developer. But the important point that I want to make is that if, if we can't find a location for that uh, elsewhere, for example, in the local centre or on the health centre, 
uh, it, which is deliverable within the timescale set out in uh, criterion B, which I'll come back to, um, then basically is going to reduce the housing numbers on the rest of the site. Uh, um, so the 665 will, will, will in fact go down. So um, that's an important what, point. To what extent that might be? Yes, it, it's probably going to be at, at least 30 or 40, I would think, houses would come off that figure. I mean, allowing for the fact that uh, um, a retirement scheme is going to be at a higher density than, than, than normal housing. So it, it will reduce the, the, the site. Um, one also has to look at the, the question of, uh, and I believe this has been the subject of negotiations uh, on the application, as to whether they could be accommodated in the local centre. The local centre is you know, relatively large, one hectare, um, but to accommodate a reasonable retail element plus a, a, um, a 60 unit uh, retirement scheme is going to be quite difficult on one hectare. I think the I, I understand that there have been discussions about possibly putting it on the health center land. Um, but the problem with that is that the health center, uh, uh, the health authorities usually take forever to make decisions on whether they're going to actually take up land like this. I've got some sites elsewhere in the country where land which has been made over to a health authority for a health facility is still undeveloped after 30 years um, as part of a, a new development. So um, getting them to make decisions, and certainly within the context of criteria B, which requires all of these uh, a retirement specialist retirement units to be uh, available before half the scheme is developed, is completely impracticable in my view if it's going to if it's if the anticipation is that it's going to be on the health authority land yeah um, um, in terms in terms of what you said there mr dobson you may have something something to follow up but i was just wondering whether if you wanted to take that forward in terms of your representations on the new school and the healthcare facility as well at that yes point. yes i i will do i've just got a um a, li a little bit more to okay. to um uh, to add i think there um Yes, I, I'm, I, I understand the council's point about putting the, these specialist facilities in central locations. Uh, and in principle, we haven't got a problem with this, but we, let's remember that this is not a central location with access to the best facilities. We're quite, uh, we're, the, the facility could be made available on that site with access to secondary facilities. And if the health authority do go there and put the facility there, then that may, puts it closer to health um, uh, facilities, but we have no certainty that that's actually going to happen yet. We've been discussing this matter now for over two years with the health authority, and we've got, no, we're no further forward now than we were at the beginning of the process. Um, so the the other point that I was just wanted to make and just add, we had a conversation the other day about um, uh, about M42, um, and there is, I appreciate that this is a special segment, if you like, of, of M42, but the whole of the rest of this development, if the local authority uh, get their policy unchanged, will be at that level. Uh, even if you go with our or the HBF proposals from reduced proportion, a significant part of this uh, development will be suitable for uh, elderly people with uh, disabled uh, who are also disabled. So um, is there really a need in this specific location for specialist uh, uh, facilities uh, for the elderly in this location? So I just leave that with you. Um, if I can move on to the question of the, uh, the making available of land uh, at no charge for the uh, for education and uh, and also for uh, for the health authority um sorry I, I did turn my telephone off but somehow it's come on again um uh, the problem that we have here is that um both the school uh, that which is proposed by ncc and the health facilities uh exceed the, the size requirement of that necessary to serve the population from that allocation. Um, so far as the health authority is concerned, uh, in very broad terms, 
um, I would imagine that we would get uh, um, from 665 dwellings uh, a population somewhere around 1,500 to 1,700 additional patients, which by my calculations is about one GP. Now, even allowing for the fact that the, they will also require specialist uh, clinics and things like that, the need for a one hectare um, uh, uh, area of land to accommodate the uh, equivalent of one GP plus clinics is 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 over provision effectively. So it doesn't meet the requirements of the MPPF of being directly related to uh, the needs of the people that you're uh, accommodating there. So to but that sorry, extent, sorry, sorry, Mr. Dobson, just on that point, I'm, I'm wondering whether, from my from my look on it, whether whether the I'm familiar elsewhere in the country that local centres often have co-location of, of healthcare facilities. Would that would that be a possible solution? For, I think that some of them are called one-stop shop facilities, where you have you have health centres uh, alongside or a part of community facilities and retail. Would that be a, a potential solution to re reduce the land take? It could be. It could certainly be a, a potential solution to, to, to doing that. Um, uh, I have no idea. I said the difficulty has been is that we have no idea what the health authority have planned uh, for Caster generally, because I think they're taking a wider view than this particular side. Um, but that suggestion that you made there, sir, would be perfectly appropriate and could be possibly be accommodated on the local centre land. I, 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 that, that was the point that I was going to put. I, I do have concerns about this avail made available at no extra cost um, element, but I, I also it also struck me that I, I can understand the reason for for the for a primary school having a specific allocation because you can't co -lo locate those facilities. But it it, does, it seems to me that a local centre will be the log logical location for healthcare facilities, and in, to to some extent. It may be possible to to modify the approach to the local centre to include some healthcare facilities, which to to meet the needs of the development, which then would provide that flexibility where you wouldn't necessarily have some land sterilised during the course of the application. You could include it in as it may be the, the case that obviously I, I'd take advice from the parties whether that would require more land take than that, up to a hectare or whether that up to a hectare might be sufficient um, to provide that flexibility. But I just, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome Mr. Hubbard's view in particular and also his clarification on, on this point of no, no, at no cost, um, because I understand, I, 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 I take, I've seen Mr. Dobson's representations on, on that matter and, and I'll give him the opportunity now before I put it to, to Mr. Hubbard to supplement that if he did, if he does. But I think that's already clearly in front of us what Mr. Most, what Mr. Dobson thinks of that. Mr. Dobson, anything further just before? Uh, no, I wasn't going to add. I wasn't going to add anything sir, to what I've already put down. Uh, I mean, it's simply it seems to me to it be contrary to the MPPF and the the, the requirement uh, for land. I was going to add a bit about the school as well, sir. Um, okay. uh, if that's okay. Um, again, very roughly, um, six sixty five. Um, uh, houses will produce uh, uh, the equivalent of a one-form FE school, which is going to be 1.2 to 1.5 hectares. Council are asking for two hectares uh, because they want to put a two FE school there. Uh, there are uh, additional factors that need to be taken into account here um, because as a result of the discussions, um, so, so effectively, just go back a stage there, effectively we're being asked to provide an extra 0.7 point five to 0.5 hectares of a land additional at no cost at all, and it will not be serving our development. However, there are additional factors at work here. Um, and I've already commented on the amount of public open space, which I thought was, you know, in general, in broad terms, seemed to be a significant part of the scheme because it's over 25% of the scheme. Um, in order to get 665 dwellings on there, um, we will not be able to, even on a pro rata basis, we will not be able to get uh, the, the full amount that's actually specified, which is 7.47 hectares. Uh, and we will require, and, we, and there have been discussions with the authority about the, um, uh, uh, the community use of the school playing field. So there is another factor involved there. And in order to get the pro rata 
amount of open space on this site, which for 665 dwellings is about 6.84 hectares, we do need uh, to make some sort of arrangements for community use of the school. So there are additional factors at work there. So. I, I wonder in terms of the open space in particular, because I, and I, it probably links to the point that, that, that you previously made in terms of being on a per dwelling basis and given the uncertainty of the housing number that, that might come forward with it being an approximate figure, um, whether, whether really it should just refer to the standards, you know, it, it, we, we, we expect, we will go on to discuss, I think, is it policy H4, Mr Hubbard, in terms of in terms of open space, but whether whether the provision has to has it's intended that it meets those standards in full, and then whatever that calculation is on the basis of of those standards per per resident, that's what would be delivered on the site, and whether that's whether there's some form of community use secured for school playing fields to contribute that, and that as part of negotiations in the future, it at least gives a a line in a line in the sand. Uh, or, or is the council wedding to, wedding to a specific number in terms of the open space? And also, if you can cover the point on um, school, school, um, the school itself that Mr. Dobson raised, and the um, the matter of healthcare as well that we covered. Okay, well, I'll start with the open space element. Um, I mean, al alongside putting an approximate number of dwellings in the allocation, we've also said approximately 7.47 uh, hectares of open space, and that 7.47 directly relates to the standard that's set out in policy H4. Okay. So we would we would expect to be applying it, 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 in, in practice on the ground. Um, if, if less than 725 came in, uh, we would be looking for the proportionately less open space in accordance with policy H4. Okay. That would be that would be our position on on the open space element. I, I think maybe maybe that could be made clear. Maybe, maybe that could be made clearer at E to say approximately seven point four seven hectares of open space should be provided, um, and then maybe in brackets in accordance with in accordance with the standards at policy H four. Obviously, that's pending any discussions that we have on policy H four. But I think that might make it clearer that that there's a direct link to the calculation there. I appreciate that because of where having viewed the site where it is and it, it it's it's physical detachment maybe from from the settlement the, the current settlement and obviously I acknowledge that there may be transport improvements to improve accessibility into case to itself but that it may have, have to have its own self-contained provision. I think that I, I I take that as fairly reasonable in that context that people may not may not choose to travel beyond um, the 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 physical barrier of the road without any significant infrastructural upgrades to actually access existing provisions. So on that basis, to my mind, it would appear reasonable um, that, that there is on-site provision to, to serve residents. But um, I think there does, does need to be that clearer distinction drawn to, to the standards in the, the plan itself. And then just in terms of the point on, if you can pick up the healthcare one, uh, the, no, the no cost and my suggestion of the possible alternative of co-location with the, lo the local centre to prevent any delays. So I think, I think that's a valid point and it's something I think we've been considering as well as part of the planning application. I think what we what we want to avoid in this this development is that we don't end up with specific uh, areas for specific uses without any real mixing of those uses. I think often you get some poor urban design outcomes where you have a particular use on a particular bit of land and then another use on another bit of land. If you can look at things a little bit more uh, uh, comprehensively, um, you can get perhaps better designed environments. So I think quite keen to look at the interaction between the local centre and and the, uh, the, the health uh, the the land for the for the healthcare care uses and ensuring that that that, that there is that kind of mixing of, of, of uses be, be, between those areas. I think the issue is, and what the, the concern was that came around um, from the actual health authorities from the NHS uh, states team was is that they they felt um, they needed at least 0.75 he he hectare site to accommodate a modern health centre on it. Um, together with car parking. But I suppose in terms of 
uh, further negotiations. I mean, we're not that far yet down that down the road, and um, uh, in, in terms of looking at that particular particular area, th there could potentially be scope for more sharing of, of, of facilities between the local centre, like you suggest. I, th I think I think what my suggestion would be that if you maybe reflect on reflect on that approach, maybe get together with Mr. Mr. Dobson outside of the hearing sessions, and and try and come to some form of agreed form of wording that. That, that both of you may be happy with. If you can't come to some agreed form of wording, you can present both parties' preferred approach of wording if, it, if there's different, and then we can maybe cover that in, in further discussion in week three. So if, if we say the 31st of March for that, and I, I'd similarly, I would say that I, I, I'm slightly uncomfortable with the justification with the no cost for the no cost element, but you may be able to address that as part of those discussions in terms of how some certainty could pro be provided to the healthcare authority without suggesting that necessarily gifting land in that context if it's not justified? I think just in terms of the justification, I mean, the, the, the healthcare authority have requested it at, um, uh, at, at no cost, um, the transfer to be at no cost. Um, there wouldn't be a need for a new health centre in case there weren't for this development. The, the, I mean, the existing healthcare centres in case are on small constrained sites and they can't be expanded. So the only way of dealing with the healthcare needs arising from this particular development is to provide a new site. So therefore, in my view, if the land does need to be provided but for, for free, and that's the only way that this is going to be delivered, then I think that is justified. I think it would be meet the test in terms of being related to, de to development necessary to make the development acceptable and fairly um, and reasonably related in scale and kind to, to, the, to the development. Um, I, think I'm I, think I'm, I think I'm uncomfortable with it as a suggestion there. It may come forward as no cost in negotiations, but I'm, I'm fairly uncomfortable with it being a, a hard and fast policy criteria because I think there has to be some flexibility uh, across the board. Given that we don't have a, a secured solution on what how the healthcare will be provided and where, I think it's very difficult to, to bind a developer to some something of, of that context. So I'd, I'd like you to reflect on the wording if there's a way that you think that it could be achieved or that or there could be specific security that it will be delivered based on the needs that you're identifying that it needs to come forward but without stating the, the gifting of land. I, I don't, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable that with, with that. I think it should be an application negotiation, not a, a policy criteria in my, in my mind. Um, it, it should be, the wording should be looser to allow negotiations to take place, I would have thought, in that context. Okay, well, we can take that view back. I mean, I, I think, I mean, clearly in any negotiation, we're guided by those principles in any case of regulation yes. 22 of the SIL regs. So we've, We've got to take that on board and the, and the key consideration that we'll be having in determining any plan and application is, is can we secure that infrastructure which we consider to be essential for the for the uh, sustainability and appropriateness of the development. I think the importance is how, how you'd secure the delivery, um, but I, 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 try and, I try and keep that element out. If that's necessary as part of a plan and application negotiation, fine. But there might be ways and means, as I've demonstrated the thoughts of things like co-location and so on, um, I wouldn't, because there's no absolute certainty of where on the site it's going, at what time, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's enough there to say, you know, this must be the process by which you go through. I think that has to come out through negotiation of, of how the site's brought forward. Yeah, that, agreed. Well, we'll yeah. As, I'll, let, I'll, suggest, I'll, let you, I'll let you reflect on that. I, I, it's just yes, it's a it's a concern that I have, Mr. Dobson. You've got your hand up. Yes, sir. I just wanted to go back. You suggested that we get together with the borough council and uh, and just see if we can draft something that's agreeable to both parties. Um, could I ask that that applies to criterion B as well? Because I, I didn't quite finish off on that. I thought I hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the at the moment uh, it, it, the retirement provision has to be has to be made available uh, before half the development is uh, is completed uh, and I would like some flexibility on that as I've indicated in our the submissions uh, because if you if you don't have it and if for example it is to go on the health authority land which is one of the suggestions that Mr Hubbard made um, and the health authority don't make a decision uh, then it could have the effect of actually stopping development on this site completely for no particular reason either. 
Okay, I, I'll take that point, Mr. Dobson. I think what, what I'm asking the council to reflect upon and, and look at is um, I, I want to, I, I want in negotiations with yourself and if possible to reach common ground as much as possible um, on criterion B, F, G and H in terms of the, the wording of those those approaches. That okay? Mr. Hubby, yes, that agreeable that you'll, do, you'll reflect on those? We will do, yeah, and we're, we're quite happy to engage with Mr. Dobson on, on those matters. I'm, yes. I'm not compelling any particular approach at this point in time. I just want you to reflect on what's been said and, and, and the representations that, that's been made. And if there's a ways and means to overcome some of those, the, the areas of dispute, then, then that might be helpful. And I particularly, like I said, emphasize that no available cost. I, I really think that that needs to be thought about a better way of securing that provision in the round of, of those criteria. Um, so just a matter of clarification, uh, yeah. do you have concerns with the, with the, with the, uh, uh, free, the, 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 the no cost transfer of land with regard to the, to the primary school as well as, as a point F in terms of the concerns that Mr. Dobson was raised? Um, I, I have, I, I have a little, con I have a little concern about having it as, uh, about, uh, about it as a policy requirement. I'm open to review revised wording, but I have concerns as how it stands in terms of the line that's drawn and the flexibility that's taken away for for solutions in the absence of a master plan. That that that's that's where I'm at right now. So I, I'm open I'm open to to review the to review anything that the council puts back to me to say this is why this is why we're doing this. But I'd suggest discussions with Mr. Dobson to understand where the common ground might be first, and then okay. obviously if the council take stands by its position, if there's an alternative form of words that he thinks it may achieve what it's seeking to achieve there, that might be more palatable in, in that context. I think in, in terms of the primary school, you, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the wider issue of the two form entry that obviously you'll need to discuss. Um, but yeah, the transfer of land issue is, is, is quite, a, quite a significant one for me in terms of embedding that as a policy criterion rather than Allowing allowing it as part of the negotiation. If that's the way that has to be done by by a, the plan application negotiation, well, that's not my problem. But and if that's something, if it needs to be delivered as part of the plan, I'm sure that there's a form of words you can get there that can be clear that it has to be delivered as part of the plan. And then obviously those negotiations can take take place outside the plan itself. Is that clear, Mr. Hubbard? Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just moving on to points I and J, um, I was just wondering um, why the council, and, and this this will this is quite a common theme throughout the council approach in the um, to each of the allocations. Um, just why the, the why it refers specifically to the the I think I, I think community facilities. I can't remember whether the community facilities are necessarily included in GSP eight, but. I wonder why, if, if, this, if there's contributions that are already listed in policy GSP8, why, does, why the policy just doesn't refer to financial contributions to, to items of infrastructure listed in policy GSP8? So we're trying to be helpful here in terms of setting out what the expectations okay. are for, for those specific sites. I think if you look at the uh, PPG on viability, the first paragraph is, it does encourage local authorities to set out exactly what they, they they expect i think that that also then obviously helps many future discussions about viability because at least the the uh expected ask um albeit it it it, it is um indicative in terms of the figures we've set out in the support and text it, but at least at, at least any developer and landowner is clear on what we might be expecting in regard to that specific site because clearly policy GSP8 is is much more wider. Just giving an example of the sorts of things, or the, or the or example of the key infrastructure that we're likely to require on certain sites. But given that we've done more infrastructure planning at the local plan stage to set out what we think is required with regard to each of the allocations, we think it's it's more effective to actually set them out in stone in in, in each each allocation. Okay. I, I, I just the only thing I'd maybe want the council to reflect on in that is what, whether it's wise, given the flexibility that, that they have 
um, in terms of what what you've done at table three point six, whether it it kind of might it might mislead mislead either statutory bodies or participants into expectations that might not ultimately come forward, um, and whether it might be better just to leave it as a per dwelling or per a per dwelling basis rather than having a an overall sum. We can we can certainly look at that um, that that particular element. I think Norfolk County Council did raise some concerns around the way we'd presented this information in, in our statement of common ground um, with Norfolk County Council. We have uh, proposed a slight amendment to the footnotes, which explains the, the, the table or caveats the table um, for each of the allocations, just to say that. That, I suppose to, to re-emphasise a bit more that, 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 that the, the figures are in, in, indicative and based on the needs as at the time the plan was written. Clearly, things can change, but we still think there's real value in having those numbers out there. But in terms of whether that there's actual a, 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 a fixed uh, total cost, um, I don't think we're necessarily wedded to that. I think it's key just given those numbers are in, are, are in the infrastructure uh, study itself. So in the plan, we could, we could perhaps, if you think it's more flexible and, and, and more effective, we could remove the, the totals and just leave the, the per dwelling. I, th I think, I think I'd, I'd ask you to look at that. I think, I think it might just be a safer approach so that you don't get people's expectations. And then particularly through a plan and application, then you see the numbers being different and, and it, you become a little bit of a hostage to fortune then. Um, so, so it's a bit a bit clearer how you're gonna how you're gonna calculate that. I think the table's helpful on a per dwelling basis, and, and in terms of where it was, obviously you might need to caveat that in terms of that you'd, you'd add inflation to it if at a, a point in time in the plan period where that's relevant. You know, it, it it's a figure at the time of the adoption of the plan, but but yeah, it gives at least it gives people a starting point. But I think it can be quite dangerous to put a some headline figures in there and then those not come to fruition um you'll get questions that you might not want at, at that particular point in time so it, it probably runs to effectiveness really um when, so it could be picked up maybe in the round in any other modifications that that are made to the the policy now just moving on to highway matters i just had a very quick one um just to say um just if the council could just direct me to the evidence source uh, which indicates the requirement for those the, the two accesses from Jack Chase Way. So it might be um, helpful to bring in Mr. Wilson here from the Highway Authority because the the highway requirements in this policy have been informed from the uh, been based on the advice that we've received from the Highway Authority. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Sorry, struggling to unmute there. Um, sorry, were you, were you querying the need for two? points of access just, just the evidence source for the, the for the for the two accesses that's all mr wilson if that's okay um i, I don't have an evidence source as, as such but um when we uh consider uh, developments of this size we would always um uh seek to secure um, more than one point of vehicular access um to ensure that uh, the um uh site is resilient okay and and it's resilient i should say yeah, so so multiple accesses for resilience, and and the reliance then is upon um, criterion V uh, Y. Sorry, in terms of the transport assessment and travel plan dealing with the the, the more detailed um, impacts on the the, tra the traffic network. Is that right? Yes, indeed. We we would um, require a, a transport assessment to uh, demonstrate. Um, appropriate evidence is provided for um, all, all types of user, um, including um, a potential impact on the existing um, highway network. Thank you. And, and you're satisfied that that's all feasible to deliver in principle, though, as an allocation? I am, yes. Thank you. Uh, nothing further. Is there anything further to add, Mr. Wilson? Thank you. I don't believe so. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'll move on from, from highways. Just in terms of part R, um, I, I just asked the count, council, I welcome any views that, that they've got, whether um, the wording should more closely reflect paragraph 170 of the framework in terms of biodiversity.
So I think I think what I'm saying in, in terms of 170 is 170D, it says minimizing impacts on and providing net gains for biodiversity, including by establishing coherent ecological networks that are more resilient to current and future pressures. Any views, Mr. Hubbard, just in terms of that wording, whether whether there might be an alternative form of words or whether it's something that you'd want to reflect upon. I mean, we could we could amend the wording slightly to replace enhance with 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 provision of net gains. The, the two things are, are similar, um, so that clearly that would um, and protect. We could replace with minimise an impact. So I think that's quite useful. Clearly, the key thing we want to to maintain here, the more site specific point in this, is about um, trying to maintain the existing hedgerow where possible because it's obviously a key landscape feature yeah. already and, and, and an element of biodiversity. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd just ask the council if, if, if you can, uh, if you add it to the list for, for the 31st of March, if there's an alternative form of words, just to, just to cover that one. Uh, yes, yeah, street lighting. I think we I think we might have covered this um, previous on A two, but it's just a question whether the addition re the addition of a reference to consideration of dark skies of surrounding areas, including the broads and their setting, might make the policy more effective. Yeah, I think that 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 would be yeah, we'd agree as a sensible um, suggestion. Uh, and it's something that we can we can we can look at. Yeah, same same again. Thirty first of March. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just in terms of Part W, um, note the statement of common ground with historic England, which includes revised wording to that criterion, and its supporting text that overcomes their previous objection, as outlined in a subsequent hearing statement. Um, any comments on? To add on the detail of that modification or whether it's necessary to, to receive to achieve the soundness of the plan with regard to heritage matters so this is well the, the, the this uh amendment came as a result of the statement of common ground that we uh agreed with historic england and historic england were of the view that it was that this was necessary to to make the uh the particular uh policy sound and justified and effective um, I think we agree that it definitely does support the, the, the does it does improve the policy, particularly picking up some of the the uh, uh, recommendations and objectives from the, the historic impact assessment that we we undertook. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dodgson. I'm assuming there's nothing to add. I don't think so, sir. It does seem to be unnecessarily detailed to me um, uh, for inclusion in a in a local plan but you know we're happy to deal with it uh, as part of the application anyway okay thank you uh, the only other one that i'd say whether there's this specific requirement specific reason why the shadow habitats regulation assessment and association with gsp5 isn't in the policy wording seem to me to be missing whether, whether there's, there might be a need for a link to policy the requirements of policy gsp5 we'll discuss gsp5 if, if that's the right reference sorry if, is it gsp5 i should be referring to or a different one it's the mitigation strategy i think i'm referring to So we've got that in the support and text um, at 3.150. I'd just ask him, would it be better as a policy criterion to be consistent with everything else to embed it in that? Because you seem to be, be helpful with the cross-reference to, to the GSP8 requirements, whether you, whether you need to do, do so with, with that. I think that would apply to most of the policies, most of the allocation policies. Um, so I don't think we've put that generally in a policy, have we? It's just, well, yeah. Um, so we can we can always put them back in into the uh, into into the policy. Yeah, just reflect on that, and if you, whichever decision put put forward to me, then I can make a, I can make a choice myself what I think is the appropriate approach. Um, Mr. Dobson, any any views on that? Just before we move on. 
No, uh, no, no views either way, sir. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we will have produced a, a shadow HRA anyway, so you know, it's not a problem. Right, just on on phasing, um, I, I I think I've covered the uh, the, the the points of master planning. Um, I'm assuming because it's a single application, there's the possibility of bringing it all all forward at once. And if there was any phasing, then that could alternatively be achieved by planning obligation. Um, do you want me to go on that, sir? Uh, you can, if either confirm or. Um, yes, it, there, there will in fact be phases, uh, and in fact, initially the application was going to be a hybrid application with phase one detail, but we rode back from that. Um, so there will be two, probably three phases to go, um, and there is a master plan, so it is being reconsidered uh, in the light of the comments of the Borough Council uh, and will be resubmitted to the authority fairly shortly. Okay, thank uh, you. And that will, that will include the phasing arrangements. Okay, thank you. I'm assuming that Miss Elba has nothing to add because that's just purely factual. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, the only final question is just whether there's anything further, just in terms of concerns about potential delays or cost of infrastructure that we haven't covered. Nothing. Right. Well, we'll move, we'll move on for that. Sorry, Mr. Gilder, we've kept you waiting. Um, which, which sites in particular is it that you want to refer to? Because I think we are running out of time. I, if if Everyone's not got objections if we take till 20 past and see how far we get. Um, it may be the case that if we, we push we push anything that we've not discussed either to this afternoon or may have to push it to reserve session. But I thought it was important that we got through um, the, the particularly large application in, in that particular case. Mr. Gilder, is there anything that you particularly want to say more generally about the allocations and the deliverability before I, I delve into, is it the Armsby St. Margaret or is it the Martham? I have concerns about the uh, delivery of the Ormsby site, sir, uh, and concerns about the delivery of the Galston Football Club site. Right, the Galston Football site that sites this afternoon. Yeah. But I yep. have seen you. I have seen you rep on that. Obviously, yep. if you're not available, it, it's something that I can pick up in the reserve session. Yeah. Uh, okay. The Galston Football site. That's up to you. you. You can deal with it at that point if you can't this afternoon. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll see. Um, I mean, I'm available this afternoon, but uh, I appreciate you've got a lot of other sites to get through. No, My... it, it is. It's certainly listed this afternoon, so okay, it, it'll be dealt with second after GM one this afternoon. So okay. okay. Well, in that case, I, I would appear, but uh, I have very severe concerns about the delivery of the land at Ormsby. Okay. Wait, both sites or no? The site for 190 <laughs> dwellings on your. So, yeah, I've had, I have seen your reps, so if there's anything to add on either of those, or in terms of... So it, it, it's land south of Cromer, for, Cromer Road first. Yes, sir. I, I think it would be helpful if I could direct a question to Mr Hubbard about this site, actually. Yes, through me. Through you. Mr Hubbard will know the owners of this site from his involvement with the development in, in, in Lowestoft, where um, the owners have been singularly inactive as house builders to the extent that um, Mr Hubbard, I think, removed their land allocation from his housing land delivery in frustration. Um, and I just wonder what his view is on, on why he thinks delivery is now going to um, take place on this site when all the evidence is that the landowners are not interested in building houses. Um, two house builders, ourselves and Norfolk Homes, have made approaches to the owners to purchase this land. They deny they even own it, um, although we have done a, a land registry search and have clear evidence that, 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 that they do. Um, it just seems to me that to have this site in the, the, the housing land delivery when the owners have no track record of delivering houses in the past um, 15 years, it, it, it's quite bizarre. And I just wondered what Mr Hubbard's view on that is. Okay, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put that to Mr Hubbard because I'll, I'll take all the rest of your rep because I've, I've seen the detail yeah. behind that rep. So I'll just put that to Mr, Mr. Hubbard. Thanks, sir. Um, well, I can confirm I, I didn't remove any sites um, by warns from the Waveney five-year supply out of sheer frustration. That wasn't quite how it worked. Um, in 
lower stuff that when I worked at Waverley District Council, we, in the same way we do at Great Yarmouth Borough Council, we contacted developers and asked what their intentions were for developing out sites. And in, in Warns in Lowestoft owned two rather large sites and they confirmed to us that they wouldn't be delivering on them within the five year supply. So we didn't put them in the supply. They also owned another smaller site, about 60 houses, uh, it, which they were, which they were building out. Um, it has been providing completions within Lowestoft over the last few years and it's still within the supply uh, in, in, in the, which is now, now East Suffolk District Councils five-year supply move, moving forward so they, they they have they do have some track record of of delivering uh houses within within lower stuff and, and there's a deliverability statement on based on based on the information that i've received yeah yeah i was gonna get on to that so the uh so we've obviously been in touch with them with regard to this particular site and they have confirmed to us that they they consider the site to be deliverable and they will be bringing forward um, houses on this site within the plan period. Uh, it's at a slower rate than we originally envisaged. So in, in the uh, five year supply statement, we're not expecting the, the entire site to be complete now until beyond the plan period, but we do still expect to see, to see delivery within the plan period. Okay. I think the other thing to point out as well with, with, with warns, um, I don't, we don't think this is their intention here, but um, elsewhere in lower stuff where they've had sites they have sold them on to other developers where they've, where they've, for whatever reason it might have been that they've not had capacity at the time but on, on the Woods Meadow scheme in lower stuff they sold their, 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 their sites on to another developer called Oldman Homes who, who were very quick at building out the, the, the particular sites okay. I, think, I think where I'm at on it is I'm probably more comfortable with it being um, potentially classified as developable in the context of, of those potential scenarios, having viewed the site uh, personally. Um, however, I, I do have some questions about uh, about deliverability based on what Mr. Mr. Gilder said. Is there anything further, Mr. Gilder, on on that on that point? Or yes, sir. The the site that Warns had has been delivered at the rate of six six houses a year, I think, in Lowestoft. Um, so. Uh, I think that puts into context the scheme that they have for 60 houses. It's taken them nearly 10 years to complete. Yes. Site, this site, this this site. Is where I am in, in terms of, I, I, did, I, I have questions about deliverability with, with you giving your suggestions of pe the pace of delivery, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a little more comfortable with at least some component of the site being in, in the developable supply. Sorry, Mr. Gilder, go ahead. This site is the subject of a, a financial uplift clause. Um, and it's our view that the clause as presently applied um, means that there's no incentive for the landowners to, to take development forward until the uplift clause um, runs its time. Um, and I think perhaps that's going to be an impediment to development. Um, I, I, I know from discussions with the the then land buyer for Norfolk Homes, who approached um, Warns, that he was told that they had no interest in this site and they were holding it for future generations. Um, you know, very mixed messages between what the landowners are telling telling developers who might be interested in purchasing it and what they're telling the local authority as a way of protecting their investment. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a very big site, 190 dwellings, and to have that site bogged down with with no delivery is going to make a big hole in the uh, housing land availability in Great Yarmouth. Okay, I'll, I'll, on the final part, I don't obviously I don't think we're going to reach agreement between no, no. the council and Mr. Gilder on this point. And I've, I've heard I've heard obviously what you've got to say, and I've I've got your representation, which I'll take into account as well. Just Mr. Hubbard on that final point, just to give you the opportunity. I mean, we're not aware of it, this this land up if clause. I mean, clearly we've got to go on on the best available information that's been submitted, and there's this, and and the landowner has submitted a statement of deliverability. We we don't have any other reason to, to question that the, the 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 rates of delivery that they're suggesting are a little bit higher than than what they've um, been delivering at at lower stuffed, but not so not to the extent that would would question the real realisticness of it. In terms of the deliverability, we based on their statement that they submitted there would only be 10 houses within the five-year supply in any in any case but 
I don't think we have any, and, and so and that would be coming in at 2024, 2025. So it's still a little way away. That might relate to 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 this particular clause that Mr. Gilder has referred to. I'm I'm, I'm not entirely sure because we, we as I said, I don't we don't know about it, but we don't really see there's any reason to 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 or, or any evidence to suggest that that those ten houses wouldn't come forward in in within the five year period. Okay. I think I'll leave it there because I, I, I think it would, there's a danger of going around in circles on, on that one. Um, yeah, I, I, as part of the update, I, I want you to look at the allocations and the, the housing supply overall. So if you think there's anything necessary to alter, but I take your position is, is at the minute that you think 10 will be delivered. Um, and obviously I'll see what, see what you say on this site and everything else in, in at the end of March. Um, I'm conscious... So, Sorry, on, the, on the matter of the football club, sir, I will rely on my written submissions. Okay, thank you. And, thank you. Uh, right, I'll, I'll just note that down. And, and I don't think in the time that we've got left available, even if we work till 20 past, we're going to get through some of my detailed comments on the criteria of the policy, which is notwithstanding any discussions about its inclusion in, in the supply as it stands. My, my, my proposal would be, and my assumption with Mr. Gil, with, with Mr. Gilder's comments is it's about the, the delivery of the site rather than the, if, if, I, if they were to be allocated, whether, the, whether there'd be the specific execution of that in terms of the policy criteria, because it's not, they're not sites in which you have a particular interest. So it may be, it may be better if I take Mr. Gilder's views now on policy OT2, and then we maybe defer the discussions on the detail of OT1 and OT2. Maybe if we've got time after the session this afternoon, would that be okay with the council? Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, we just might have to have a, a longer session, but I'll stick within the half past four ending this afternoon. Um, and then obviously if we don't get through anything at that point, uh, we'll have to defer it to the reserve sessions, but we'll try our best. Um, Mr. Gilder, you don't have anything to say on the Martham site either, do you? No, sir, I don't. Yes, well, Martham will probably just do, will, will probably take to this afternoon as well, because I don't think there's any particular interested parties who, who have an interest in that. I'll announce that at the start of the session, um, but I'll ensure that there's an opportunity on both the Arms and the Martham sites in the reserve sessions in any case, if people can't attend the sessions when we, when we seek to deal with them today. Does that appear to be an agreed, uh, an acceptable approach? No, that's fine. So I don't need to attend this afternoon's session. You, you do not. I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to to comment now in the remaining time available on uh, policy OT two, which is the land south of. Uh, have we done the? There's land south of Cromer Road, and then it's OT two, which is north of Barton Way. Yes. Yes, so similarly, if there's anything to add on your representations on Barton Way. No, sir, I, I have nothing to add to that. Any response in, in while Mr. Gilder, Gilder's in the room, Mr. Hubbard on Barton Way? I'll just bring in uh, Mr. Bulls on, on this one. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so in response to Mr. Gilder's um, matter statement, um, essentially we've had confirmation from the developer of flagship homes um, that um, there is a that they have a solution to the ransom strip issue, um, and this won't prohibit the development site from coming forward. So uh, in that terms, there is um, no availability issue for that site. Is there an intention to publish that or is it commercially sensitive? We don't, we don't think it's uh, commercially sensitive, but we'll just take a double check on that. Yeah, if, if so, it might be helpful to, pub to publish as part of your overall update in turn, so that Mr. Gilder would have the opportunity to see what, what's been said about that. And if he felt there was a need to comment on upon it, upon it in week three, there'd be an opportunity to do so. Okay. Okay. So if I can ask you to do that again, March 2021. Mr. Gilder, are you happy to wait on, on that information? If, if yes, sir. Okay. 
Right. I, th I think it, it's probably it's probably not in 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 the interests of progressing forward. Other than other than just to ask one further question, and my assumption is from the parties that because of the size of the Barton Way allocation, uh, it being thir thirty two dwellings, that in theory, if that allocation is the one to come forward, and I've, I've taken the point that there's that there are there's the developer was seeking to progress a larger allocation in that context. Um, my assumption from if the council want uh, have they got any update in terms of that whether 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 the intention is to stick hard and fast with the 32 and that the remainder is inappropriate i did view the the remainder of the site which is an emission site so i am familiar with it uh I, yeah, I'm come on that so yeah we are essentially we don't uh, need the additional land to the north um uh, to be developed and obviously it, it extends out into open countryside and open countryside so um we would um, like to hold on to the 32 dwellings as part as, as per our allocation. Okay, and, and just just while I have Mr. Wilson here, in terms of Barton Way in particular, um, I know I know there's um, the council's hearing, hearing statement refers to proposed modifications to modify not to modify the housing requirements in accordance with the statement of common ground uh, as set out in document 1.2 requiring requiring vehicular access from Barton Way. There is a representation that indicates that access by a third way on North Road will be achievable. Um, can you clarify why the access via Barton Way specifically is necessary? Um, that, that's how the um, allocation I thought was um, presented to us that uh, the site would be accessed via Barton Way. Okay, if the council can just shed some light and, on there's a reason why it has to be Barton Way, if it does have to be. It's, Yeah, this, I mean, from from our from our point of view, in terms of how the site has been come through the the HeLa and and also the um, the assessment procedure, that, that that on the advice of the highway, the um, the site should be accessed up Barton Way. Okay. Okay. And 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 I'm a, do I have to take it that third way up on North Road would be unachievable, or or would there be feasibility issues? Um, we, we have received um, outline representations on, on forming an access via um, Thurn Way. Um, the, the road appears to be of um, limited width and is subject to um, on-street parking. Um, but we, we haven't yet had an opportunity to look in detail at those proposals. Um, Barton Way, um, by contrast, whilst it's a narrow road, it seems to have sufficient scope for improvements to bringing it up to an acceptable um, standard for um, highway access. Okay. I just ask, in, in light of obviously Thurn Way, if I could ask um, the council and, and yourself just to just to discuss if there's any progress made on that before the end of March in terms of Thurn Way and if there's any firm um, issues in terms of that that can be brought that can that can be added to in terms of the alternative options just to yeah, just to certainly. address the representations if that 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 would be helpful. Agreed. Right, I think I think that that we've we've probably taken the discussions as far as we can, um, and I've covered the areas that I wanted to cover in light of um, Mr. Dobson and Mr. Mr. Gilder and Mr. Wilson's at attendance in this particular session. Um, I'm happy to pick up. The more detailed policy approach issues after the session might be said as long as that's agreeable with the council this afternoon if we have enough time or defer it to week three uh, are all parties happy with that approach and I'll, I'll, i will make sure in the reserve sessions that there will be an opportunity if, if there's need for an extra reserve session i'll, I'll let, let parties know in due course to cover that okay thank you well on that on that basis matter three uh issue three is adjourned it's um, 1 17 and um, we'll reconvene at two o'clock um, we'll start with the allocations as listed on the hearings program and then we'll have a, a, a discussion on on the specific policies OT1 OT2 and MA1 if, if there's if, if we have time thank you